Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, we are going to, to start our October session of our seminar, Iberotac, uh, dedicated to uh, maritime culture and tacit knowledge. It is a great pleasure for me uh, to introduce our speaker today, Margaret Schott. Margaret Schott is? I say Scotty. Scotty. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, Margaret yeah. Scotty. Okay, sorry. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Margaret is Associate Professor of Early Modern History in York University in Toronto. Her research and teaching interests include Renaissance and Reformation, history of the book and reading, history of science and technology, and especially, very especially, maritime history. This is the reason because uh, Margaret is uh, today with, with us. Uh, Professor Scotty has published very interesting te texts on these topics, among which I would highlight, of course, a very important book, her latest book, Saving a School, Navigating Science and, and a Skill, a very important book in our, in our line of research, uh, published by the prestigious uh, John Hopkins University Press in Baltimore, I encourage to read uh, this, this book. But today, Margaret will be talking about this book. Today, Margaret is going to talk about Sun and Sado, astronomical knowledge and navigational diagrams. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you very much for accepting again our invitation. And I give you the, the floor. Thank you. OK, fantastic. Let me share my screen okay. and make sure yeah. everything is all right. Everyone can see. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay, so, and I will hide my face. <laughs> uh, so, muchas gracias por la invitación. Lamento no poder presentar en español. Ahora, I would like to begin with two images. The first on the left, you may have already seen. It is from Pedro de Medina's 1545 Arte de Navegar. The second on the right is from a Dutch manuscript, a navigational school workbook, more than two centuries later. These are two very different circles, but I would like to suggest they are both tools to help visualize and compute position. Specifically, a navigator can determine his latitude from the sun's altitude, so long as he knows the daily declination. Now, we might view the image on the left as charming, but not very technical. It is the one on the right with the numbers and lines for calculating that became ubiquitous for mariners across Northwestern Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries. However, they are conceptually linked. Over the course of my talk today, I will show you the evolution from one to the other. This work comes from a chapter I'm finalizing for a volume on scientific diagrams and their uses. Today, I'd like to go into some more detail about the early Iberian context, because that will let us dive into how navigators tacit knowledge evolved as it was printed and codified. Please join me on a lightning tour of altitude diagrams to explore the relationship between knowledge gained over years of experience with numbers and visual tools. Now, I know this audience is familiar with the story about the rise of new physical and conceptual tools when Iberian sailors began to venture across the Atlantic to the Caribbean and further south in the late 15th century. Out of sight of land for long periods, they needed to develop methods and instruments to determine their position. As you probably know, they developed what are called the regimento, rules for the sun, as well as certain stars. These early regiments were meant to provide very explicit instructions. Here is the regimento uh, for the stars for the North Star uh, from Zamorano's Compendio del Arte de Navegar in 1588. And you can see the beginning, there are eight rules that are based on the position of the guard stars at the end of the Little Dipper. And this tells you how many degrees away from true north the pole star was. So um, this is basically how these regiments work. Uh, here is Cortez's version from 1561. Now what is really interesting is that it doesn't take long for this simple list to be turned into an instrument. And here in the same uh, 1561 volume is Cortez's spinning volvel, uh, the disc that provides the regiment in visual form. And you can see, uh, if you can see my um, 
pointer, the guards are at the top of the horn and the opposite end points to true north. Unfortunately, in Cortez's influential first edition, there was a significant error. Uh, and right here at the bottom, you see this 4.9. Um, and this is actually um, a, a, not a typo, but Cortez chose to ignore um, what most working pilots used, which was the number 3.0. Um, choosing instead to use the number suggested by the German astronomer Johann Werner. Um, and so that fact um, meant that the Volvel and his table or his, his regiment had a serious error of at least 1.5 degrees. So a lot of navigational instruments are like this one, a circle or dial, uh, which enables the navigators to avoid numbers. They don't have to worry about calculating uh, to obtain their final position or the actual number of, of th that they're looking for. Um, and they're really using the kind of circular motion of the earth and the heavens and turning it into these spinning dials. However, it is not easy to do this for latitude. In a lot of ways, latitude seems straightforward, especially compared to the challenges of calculating longitude. We know that latitude can be derived from the observed height of the sun at noon each day, and you can even uh, use certain stars after dark to do the same thing. But this basic daily task of determining one's position is more complex than it seems. After a navigator obtains an observation, again, usually at noon, but it could be at dawn or it could be at midnight, he then needed to make numerous adjustments. Some of these were minor to take into account uh, optical effects such as refraction uh, or dip. These might just be refinements of a degree or two, um, but others were more significant. And the most important of these was the sun's declination. Uh, the angle relative to the equator. So here uh, is just a modern diagram uh, for the technical side of things, but each day uh, we know the sun appears to move along the ecliptic, which is the tilted red line in the center of the circle. Uh, and this is the plane of the Earth's orbit, which gives us the seasons. So this declination varies over the course of the year from a height of uh, um, 23.6 degrees, and um, these are the, the winter and summer solstices. Um, but then at the fall and spring equinox, uh, the declination equals zero. So we can get these daily angles from almanacs, um, but we need to take into account whether it's a leap year or not. In Cortez's volume, um, in order to determine the, the declination, readers would need to consult three separate tables. So again, declination seems straightforward, but it is more tricky. Uh, and if you don't take this number into account, any day's position calculation could be off by more than 20 degrees. The other thing to be aware of um, for mariners was their position relative to the equator. Uh, because again, the required calculations differ depending on which side of it uh, they were on and also the sun. And again, at first glance, the criteria are not too difficult. When the observer is in the same hemisphere as the sun, you add both components. Uh, when the observer and the sun are in different hemispheres, uh, we need to subtract the declination. But what does it mean if this result is a negative number? What happens when the merchant ship on the way to the Indies is right at the equator um, and the sun might be similarly close. So how do you handle really um, small differences of position? And what about whalers who are sailing north into the Arctic where the summer sun never set? All of these were challenges that uh, navigators needed guidance on. To keep track of all this, mariners turned to diagrams and we see lots of examples in their manuscripts. This is uh, from 1697 in England. Uh, here's another English example from a few years later. Um, the problem could not easily be converted into a volvel. Uh, there were just too many variables. Um, this is a Dutch example, again, from uh, the 1760s. 
some cleverly clever mathematically inclined entrepreneurial teachers did the next best thing they developed a type of geometrical calculator a stationary circle that could be a visual and mathematical aid for computing the current latitude from a celestial observation so let us trace the steps now from the little man um, with his shadow to these calculating circles the declination circles that you see here first appear in the early 17th century, emerging from uh, the explanatory traditions of two key concepts. First, we need to demonstrate that the height of a celestial body is the equivalent to an individual's current latitude. So we need to sort of prove that or understand that first. And then secondly, we need to account for the perceived movement of the sun. And we know that these two ideas were both treated in the cosmography textbooks that had been fixtures of university teaching since the 13th century. The sphere text of Johannes Sacrobosco and the many later editions offer sophisticated visual solutions to both these questions. Uh, in particular, the new 16th century editions by uh, Peter Appianus um, with the compelling images uh, were really effective at teaching uh, viewers circular motion and because they were so um, helpful they were quickly adopted into the rash of new navigation manuals that were being produced in um, Seville and elsewhere in Iberia. Of the five volvels that Appianus introduced into cosmographical works in the 1520s this horizon man is probably the most engaging. Here uh, in Sacrobosco's sphere, we can see how uh, Appianus demonstrates the connection between the observer's position on the earth and latitude. Uh, this small man aligned with the zenith pointer is standing here on the earth. And uh, the instrument basically confirms that the number of degrees between the elliptic, which is the equinoctial line, and the observer's zenith is the same as the number of degrees between the local horizon and the pole. Um, so using the geometrical theorem of complementary angles, where we know that two angles add up to 90 degrees, if you rotate the horizon man 30 degrees to one side of the ecliptic, then the horizon must be 60 degrees to the other. So again, people are really assuming that their, their readers have this geometrical understanding. Um, and it's this little uh, spinning volvel that shows why small humans on Earth can use their point of observation uh, as the equivalent of their latitude. The next volvel in Appianus uh, Cosmographia uh, focuses on the angle of the sun's declination more explicitly. Um, it demonstrates how time can be calculated from the sun's movement. Uh, this uh, particular volvel here is often called the Organum Ptolemaei. Um, and I have to say this instrument is far less intuitive than the Horizon Man. It consists of a graduated disc and has uh, usually three rotating elements, um, although here there are just two. Uh, there's the triangle, the horizon bar, and then this uh, oblong grid in the background. And this instrument is intended to be functional, but the fact that it's within a bound book and made of flimsy paper components really made it hard to use. Uh, the observer was instructed to hold the book facing the sun uh, with the weighted thread hanging perpendicularly. And then the small corner of the triangle needed to be adjusted uh, so that the sun's rays would pass over it. And the height of the sun can be read off the adjacent scale. So again, it, it sounds um, compelling, but was actually hard um, to do, especially when it was just in a book. Um, we do find a few actual instrument versions of this Organum Ptolemae. Um, this one is actually um, uh, from 1551 in Germany. Um, and really, we don't find uh, physical Organum Ptolemaei uh, anywhere but Germany. And this was um, really elaborate and would not have been made for mariners. 
uh, I want to draw your attention to the, um, this large background portion of the diagram, uh, this kind of rounded oblong shape that's marked with a grid uh, formed by the intersection of 12 lines. Uh, and you can see they're numbered here and they represent the hours. And then we have the longer perpendicular declination lines. Um, and this represents the orthographic projection uh, corresponding to when the sun enters certain zodiac signs. Um, often you can see the zodiac uh, sort of six on each end. Um, so this distinctive oblong grid actually represents a year's worth of the sun's motion. Uh, and it really appears in simplified form in most cosmographical and astronomical texts before and after uh, the cosmographia. Uh, this simple diagram of the oblique sphere shows that here, again, it's tilted on an approximately 23 degree angle. Um, and this again is the difference between the ecliptic plane and the celestial horizon. Uh, and this is going to help explain the sun's motion. So this tilted ecliptic would be familiar to anyone who had uh, studied or used an armillary sphere. Um, but again, that was tricky to, to learn too. So, um, so through his remarkable graphical program, Appianus taught readers the correlation between one small human's position and the grander concept of terrestrial latitude. He then provided a tool, although a somewhat finicky one, for measuring that latitude. However, the text accompanying these instruments does not provide concrete steps for the pressing question of how to obtain a numerical answer from a single observation. We have to wait until the texts specifically focus on navigation to get these tools. Here is Pedro de Medina's handsomely illustrated Arte de Navigar from 1545. And again, um, this book is filled with graphical elements and many full page woodcuts. Um, money was no object for Medina. Uh, here you can see he is using uh, large circles. There will actually be a series of 16 of them to document the rotating position of the little dipper. Um, so where Cortez saved paper by just showing it on one page, um, Medina uh, draws 16 circles. Uh, he approached the topic of the sun in book four. Uh, he introduces it very reverently. One of the most skilled things and one of the greatest understanding in the art of navigation is the height of the sun, for it perfectly teaches the route which he who navigates does or should do. So then Medina reviews 17 essential definitions. You know, you need to know the vocabulary to be able to understand this material. And then he sets out to explain five types of shadow to the reader. And so here is the shadow man that I began my talk with. Um, and you can see uh, this is the uh, first edition. And then over here, uh, I believe the first French edition. And so, uh, the man, the shadow, and the sun are, you know, evident in different positions, um, and they depend on, again, whether the observer is located above or below the equator, and also the sun's position relative to the equator. Here you see the sun is on the equator and the observer is below, um, and so this will impact, here you can just see the shadow here, um, the direction in which these shadows are going to fall. Uh, so Medina, again, uh, takes up space and has a, a great woodcutter, evidently, uh, and he presents 13 woodcuts to show these five types of shadows. Uh, especially want to draw your attention to these um, intriguing people. Um, and in each edition, they're somewhat different. But uh, here is sort of a um, someone garbed in, in military gear with, uh, you know, a, a sort of feathered uh, helmet here. Um, and then this is probably a nymph kind of draped in, in some kind of flowing fabric. So if you ever recognize them or have seen them in any other contemporary works, I'd be really interested to know um, if they had another um, origin, because I don't know why um, Medina would need 
naked nymphs in his in his book. Um, so uh, we see that the series of pole star uh, rotations can be converted into a simple volvel, but these 13 rules are not able to be converted. Uh, the type of shadow varies depending on the geographic location of both the observer and the sun, and it just makes it complicated to turn this into a, um, a simple circle. Um, one thing the Medina's text does do is include many more practical details uh, compared to the cosmographical precursors. Um, we can see in the illustrations that uh, the navigator was to use the familiar astrolabe uh, rather than the um, new complicated uh, flimsy paper tool that Appianus suggested. Uh, the observer could use his own shadow, or he could look at the um, shadow cast by the ship's mast, or anything else that he stands upright. So again, there's sort of uh, instructions in, in Medina's text uh, for um, walking through the steps of this problem. Um, Medina reiterated the importance of knowing which rule to apply based on the time and current location. He noted very sternly, the pilot must understand not just the words of these rules, but also the sense and the reason. And if he only knows the rule without understanding the reason or foundation, Medina was you know, very serious about this, a great deal of damage could follow. Most navigators who ran into difficulties allegedly either blamed their instruments or the rules, but Medina didn't want to give them any such excuses. To, to clarify the rules and to underscore their importance, he printed a second set of nine larger circles. So again, two of them are here. Um, and then similarly like this, you can see a single figure hunched over in the direction of the smiling sun. Uh, and again, he's holding a miniature astrolabe in his left hand. Um, so again, this is uh, rule number one, and I just read it so you can see uh, how complicated it is. With the sun being in the north part, if the shadows are to the north, you are in the north, and the sun is between you and the equinoctial line. Look at the number of degrees of altitude you have observed and how many you need to make 90 and add the day's declination with the lesser of the degrees. And that's how far north you are distant from the equinoctial line. Okay. Um, from the first set of circles, we know that the shadows are the main indicator for choosing the appropriate rule. And Medina didn't explain the significance of a 90 degree angle. His readers either already know it, or as long as they complete the steps that he describes, they didn't need to. The main conceptual problem, whether you should add or subtract the declination, is mentioned only in passing in the final sentence. Clearly, Medina did not view that step as confusing in any way. So in his book, his tone is direct and personable. Um, and He's a first person. It's quite uh, different from the Appianus book. Um, but Medina tied himself into repetitive knots trying to describe verbally what Appianus had conveyed so clearly with his Horizon Man Volvel. And while Medina's shadow diagrams are charming, they remain conceptual demonstrations rather than a functional instrument. His text did not include any mathematical calculations or any expectation that readers should produce their own diagrams. We will see that this changes by the end of the century. The first Dutch author to recast Medina's shadow circles was Willem Blau in his 1608 Lichter Seefahrt. Uh, you can see here, this is chapter 12 on how one can measure and calculate the height of the sun or stars. And Blau offers an updated series of nine declination circles. Uh, so where the men in Medina's sons were simply holding their astrolabes, Blau is depicting an, element man, an elegant man wearing a ruff and hose. And here you can see him kneeling on the horizon uh, in the act of using an oversized mariner's astrolabe. Um, and then there's a variation here where the mariners are using their uh, preferred cross staff 
And it's interesting here that uh, Blau does away with the observer's body, leaving just a head and a cross staff positioned at eye level. Um, and so I would uh, just want to draw your attention to a few things. These circle images are the first uh, to clearly record specific astronomical details. Uh, they're labeled um, horizon here or Kimmen, um, and they label the zenith. Um, again, so this kind of evokes uh, Apianus's horizon man. Um, and the dotted line that stretches between, sorry, here, this one, uh, between the instrument uh, and the sun uh, marked on the circumference is really so that Blau can demonstrate the angle of vision, right? So he's really wanting you to um, basically imagine that your head is here uh, with the head of this cross staff observer. It is instructive, uh, and again, I know this is technical, but hopefully you are with me. Um, it's instructive to try to recreate uh, Blau's process for constructing these diagrams. Um, if he constructed the diagram or made the notations in the diagram in the order that the text suggests, uh, Blau started by marking the position of the sun, uh, D here, as accurately as possible on the circumference above the horizon, which is AB. Uh, he would then mark the declination, E, for equinoctial line. Uh, and he, as best he could, this would be an appropriate distance away from the sun and in the correct direction. Uh, so then he would next draw the line EH through the center of the circle, um, perpendicular to the Earth's axis, which is PG. Um, and then P here is the North Pole. So this differs from modern representations of declination. Uh, because that would have the line passing through the center only at the equinox. Um, and again, just to try and show you my cursor over on the, and it's not showing up, but if you look at the, um, the circumference over by AE, um, you add the altitude or you subtract it, and then you are going to get the number AE. You subtract that number from 90, um, and Blau shows this, but he doesn't write it. And that's the complementary arc AP below the horizon. Um, and so then we once again use uh, complementary angles to, um, this is the theory of vertical angles. You get this arc GB on the other side. So <laughs> even though the sun with its uh, dotted line of sight is probably the most noticeable element here, the purpose of this diagram is to place the equinoctial line correctly. Uh, so although Blau may have intended these diagrams to help in computation, he doesn't show or explain the arithmetic. Um, and then one th thing to note um, is he does uh, adapt these diagrams um, and shows the central observer facing the correct direction towards the South Pole uh, G when the question deals with an observation made in the Southern Hemisphere. So again, here he's facing towards P, the, the North Pole, um, for this particular question. Well, that was 1608. The following year um, in Rotterdam, um, a small school teacher, uh, Jan van der Brugge, um, produces his own small textbook. And whereas um, Blau's instructions were in his large atlas volume, um, van der Brugge had a very sort of cheaply produced, um, badly printed in a lot of ways, but very heavily illustrated um, textbook. And this, again, maybe like Medina, had lots of, of attention to visuals. Um, and van der Brugge incorporated eight volvels. Uh, he included a version of the Organum Ptolemae, uh, which I showed you earlier. Um, and he included Appianus's Horizon Man. Uh, he called it the spinning little man on the world. So again, here he is. Um, so van der Brugge tells us that contemporary Dutch practitioners were following a general rule uh, where they subtracted all negative or Northern declinations and added all Southern ones. But he warned that you shouldn't oversimplify this. So he doesn't 
provide a list of rules, but he does include a dozen circle problems. Um, and here is one. We can tell that these are intended as teaching tools because they are labeled much more carefully than uh, blouse, for example. Um, he labels the North and South Pole. Uh, he labels the horizon. Sorry, that can't be the North, but this is the North Pole here. Um, he labels the horizon um, and South is on the left and North is on the right. Uh, and then he has the equinoctial or the uh, linear, the synonyms both for the ecliptic. Um, for each question, the ecliptic is drawn in the correct position. So when the problem is talking about a latitude of just 10 degrees, the line is really close uh, to the horizon. Um, when the latitude is given as 50 degrees, here it's given as 52. So this is a, you know, approximately halfway between the 90 degree angle here. Um, and the sun and the stars are also drawn in the appropriate position. And it's a little hard to see, but uh, their, their degrees are labeled on the woodcut. Unlike Blau, Van der Brucke provides very little explanation of the mathematics in his text, uh, but a reader who is good with numbers can follow along uh, here on the side in the calculations. Now, uh, what is kind of unexpected in Van der Brucke uh, is the last six of his 16 uh, diagrams are adorned with disembodied heads. Um, and again, uh, we saw Blau had a disembodied head, but I cannot figure out what these guys are doing. Um, Van der Brucke was such an innovative pedagogue, who paid so much attention to visual aids. Um, but this one here, this is just a man staring north um, I don't know if this is to help the viewer, the observer, or if it's uh, just a misle misleading or extraneous detail. I really haven't figured this out. Um, so as the 17th century continues, uh, we are going to see these type of whimsical personified diagrams um, appear much less frequently. Uh, only one generation after Blau and Van der Brucke's work uh, we are going to see a new style of manual, um, which is going to help shape the competitive Dutch market of navigation schools and instruction. Um, and this is the comprehensive navigation textbook. Um, and I'm happy to discuss how this uh, differs from Medina or other cosmographical texts. Um, Cornelis Janssen Lassmann uh, published the first of these major textbooks. Uh, the Schaatkammer des Groten Seefahrtskunst, and uh, the first edition was 1621. Uh, here is the 1629. Um, the conclusion of part one of Lassman's textbook, you can see a concise treatment of how to obtain latitude by measuring the sun's height. Um, and Lassman uses just three rules. Um, and so I guess that's similar to um, Van der Broeke's sort of general convention. Um, and he follows each of these three rules with a textual explanation and a clearly labeled diagram. Uh, I think it's interesting, Lassman draws semicircles rather than the full circles we're used to seeing. Um, and this is because you rarely need the bottom half of the circle to make these computations. Um, and he was likely interested, he or his publisher uh, wanted to conserve paper. Uh, this is a little closer. Um, uh, zoom in on a, a different question here, um, and we'll see a few things. Rather than decorating the sun with a face or even rays, Lassman follows astronomical conventions, uh, using only a simple circle with a dot. Um, and significantly, the diagrams are marked not only with the sun's height and declination in degrees, but then the sum of these two figures. So again, he's doing the math for you here in uh, along the circumference. For Lassman, the diagrams were a key part of his lesson. After briefly laying out the terms of an example problem and giving the answer, he offers the proof in three related formats, textual, arithmetical, and diagrammatic. So up here it says, de proof is these, uh, and so here is the textual explanation, the mathematical one, and the diagrammatic. Um, as Altitude observations were measured upwards from the horizon. Um, uh, we, we can infer maybe from Lassman's uh, 
presentation here, that his readers already knew to subtract their observation from 90 degrees. Again, there's this kind of baseline mathematical knowledge um, by the time you're getting to this type of question. And Lastman works through his diagrams in a different order than Blau did. He measures down from the zenith, the top point here, uh, to mark the sun's position down here, uh, 66 degrees or 65. Um, and then depending on the situation, he moves up or down the circumference to note where the line should intersect. So he goes back up 17 degrees here. Uh, and where Van der Brucke had marked the degrees on his diagrams, Lastman goes a step further, showing the arithmetic right here on the circumference. Um, Again, I want to note that he definitely assumed that his readers were already familiar with um, the basics of geometry and complementary angles. So where Medina had laid out many possible combinations of the position of the sun, observer, and horizon, Lastman condensed these down to just three rules. Uh, again, one, the sun's declination and shadow are both in the same direction, north, north, or south, south. Uh, the second rule, the declination and shadow are the opposite, uh, north and south or south and north. Um, and the zenith angle is greater than the declination. And then finally, the third rule, the declination and shadow are opposite and the zenith angle is small or smaller than the declination. So again, here's this approach, right? Can we streamline things and make them uh, easy to learn? Uh, in this case, last one seems to have been too economical. Uh, so we're going to see the next major navigation textbook in the Netherlands is uh, Klaas Hendriksen Gietemakers Vergulde Lichte Zeevaart, The Golden Light of Navigation. And Gietemaker includes a substantially larger set of rules. He's got seven, and he illustrates these with 19 uh, circles and then another five for the star rules. He also, as you can see here, uh, begins to introduce the concept of spherical trigonometry, where the sun is not on the uh, circumference, but slightly down here. And so it requires more advanced mathematics to work these problems. Um, but when we look at these diagrams, you'll notice that uh, we're no longer labeling the horizon. We are no longer uh, adding math along the circumference we have switched to minimalist alphabetical labels. Um, and again, I would argue this suggests a readership uh, that's more familiar or more comfortable reading this type of diagram. Kretemacher's textbook was reprinted at least 20 times. It was the most influential nautical manual in uh, Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, and it is Kretemacher's seven rules that show up in many of the manuscript workbooks. Um, I would like to um, raise the idea that this type of simplified sort of uh, labeling probably comes from mathematical works. Um, here is an example, again, a Dutch mathematician uh, with nearly the same type of, um, of circular diagram. Um, and again, this is a mathematical textbook um, from the 1640s, um, probably originated in the 1620s. And so I think the this is evidence that um, nautical authors are using the visual program of another field, in this case, um, mathematics or even astronomy, to enrich maritime education. What about other parts of Europe? So I must confess I have uh, not found this type of circular diagram in Spanish uh, textbooks in the uh, later 17th or 18th century yet, but again, I'd be grateful if you uh, know of any. Um, maritime communities in England and France embrace these circular tools. Uh, this is the work of Sanson Le Cordier, um, and he really was a believer in the importance of um, diagrams for comprehension. And again, he thinks the first thing any student should do is draw their own diagrams to help understand uh, their relative positions. So when it comes to latitude problems, Le Cordier wanted his readers to construct their own circles. And uh, he provides step-by-step -step instructions for creating these diagrams. He tells readers to describe a circle using their compass, uh, divide the circumference into four equal parts. So again, kind of on the 90 degrees here. Uh, to zoom in, you uh, mark the sun at B, and then Le Cordier continues, 
count the amount of the declination from point B on the horizon side, and it will end at point C. So from, it's from here up to point C, there you will draw the equinoctial line CV. So the degree of detail in Le Cordier's textbook uh, highlights the amount of tacit mathematical knowledge uh, that other authors had taken for granted. Right? The very fact that he's walking through and he needs half a dozen steps to explain how to draw this diagram makes you realize that uh, Lassman and Chitamacher's readers uh, already understood these things. Uh, in terms of the um, labeling of these diagrams, uh, Le Cordier, like Chitamacher, um, had a spare and stripped down image with uh, free of text. But what I find fascinating is when we look at contemporary manuscripts, we find that a majority of them uh, are labeled in, more fully by their creators. So again, this is a French one, it's a little bit hard to read, but um, this is uh, the equinoctial line here and uh, the horizon, the true horizon here. So again, uh, readers take advantage of the flexibility of their manuscript workbooks to um, help themselves and give more information. Uh, this is one of my famous, uh, favorite characters, Asuras van Assen. Um, he really um, often finds um, problems in his textbook that he then has to um, roll back because actually the textbook author is correct and he's not. Um, and I think here he was probably in too much of a hurry to add extra labels. Um, he was working through, in this case, some stellar declination problems. And uh, in this example here in the center, he initially drew his declination line in the wrong direction. Uh, so then he had to cross this out and draw a new circle. Um, so again, I think this is uh, just proof of, of people working through this in the classroom. Other students uh, embellished their spheres, not just with the blazing suns that we saw in the 16th and 17th century, but with ink or watercolor highlights. Um, I've really tried to see whether there's any kind of pattern uh, to this particular author, uh, Cornelis Bombar. Uh, I don't see, I think he just kind of liked making his workbook um, more visually appealing, but it's not necessarily that the red always means complementary, although you might think so here. So again, um, it would be neat to spend some more time with this particular manuscript um, to see whether Bombar had had a, um, a clear pattern or not. Um, so the large number of these circles produced in international classrooms over more than a century really confirm the value that educators and students placed on them. And yet, the, despite how carefully these authors replicated them in print and manuscript, we don't find these declination circles um, in use on board ship. I have not found any examples of these circles, even in the rough daily computation books or in more formal record keeping. So we have to ask what purpose did these diagrams ultimately serve? I would like to suggest that this type of circle initially really depicted the observer's position from Appianus's horizon man to Blau's astrolabe wielding gentleman humans took their observations of the heavenly bodies from the center of the cosmos. But when that observer boarded a roaming merchant ship, it became very daunting to try and depict his intersection with the sun that was oscillating along the ecliptic. Unlike some of the other abstract concepts that shaped the sailor's daily tasks, this one could not be readily, readily translated into a volvel or other device. Navigation instructors soon realized that like so many aspects of celestial navigation, mariners needed to be comfortable with math to solve this problem. Therefore, the circles took on another purpose, switching from placeholder to computational tool. The circles became a frame that helped the observer visualize the variables of the sun's position, of his position, and of the consequent shadows. Declination circles were an important teaching tool by using their drawing compasses to solve these problems, students would gradually learn the rules, whether there were three or seven or 10 of these rules. They would eventually get a sense for which pairings of altitude and declination 
were likely to occur on a transatlantic voyage, which other combinations they would encounter only in the rare case where they might be sailing north to the Arctic Circle. We can never know who first devised this method of representing the sun's apparent motion as tilted lines on a simple circle, or who then took the next step to manipulate its position along their circumference. Yet, by studying the development of these diagrams, we can see how the science of navigation blended insights and instruments from astronomical and mathematical traditions. The project begun by Sacro Bosco and Medina of teaching individuals how to visualize the sphere on which they lived ultimately helped navigators in the 17th and 18th centuries develop an understanding of which rule to choose, which numbers made sense, uh, here, we actually see codified diagrams helping to develop tacit knowledge for a new generation. Gracias. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Margaret, for this wonderful presentation. I think we have here a, a very, very good example of, of tacit knowledge. Uh, so now we would now open the discussion to all attendees, comments, questions, doubts. Jose <laughs> uh, Maria, no? Okay, I, I see your, <laughs> your, your hand raised. Uh, okay, Julia, please. Yeah. Yes, thanks a lot. That, I really enjoy uh, your talk. It was it was really great, and the images, the circles were also amazing to look at. Mm -hmm. So I have um, a question about this uh, point that Antonio made about uh, tacit knowledge, no, and that you referred to a couple of times throughout the the talk. And I wanted to know exactly um, what kind of uh, conclusions would you make uh, regarding tacit knowledge here in the sense that you said at the end that you think there's a, um, a development or transition from using these diagrams as placeholders to using them for specific calculations. And I was seeing that the transition regarding tacit knowledge also goes somehow in that direction. So um, it, it seems that uh, in the 16th century that tacit knowledge had to do with um, uh, uh, practice, exper actual experience of how to, uh, look and being able to use um yeah uh, to, um, to like uh, um tacit knowledge is about the practice how how you can actually use it navigating mm -hmm. and uh, later on in the 1780th century the tacit knowledge becomes previous mathematical knowledge so that's the thing that i i was not very sure about mm -hmm. if in later on also this tacit knowledge is about the practice itself what is more about the theoretical knowledge thanks um well, I guess so much of the literature sort of assumes that tacit knowledge disappears once we get print, right? Once we get sort of education formalized in the classroom. Um, and initially that's kind of the trajectory that I saw with these stories, right? Because from the Regimento, then we have the numbers that get written down and then we get this sort of tool that replaces, or, you know, I think it's basically, you know, turned into textbook learning, right? But as I was writing this talk, I think actually by the end, these students are still expected to have a, a takeaway, right? And I don't know whether it's exactly that the circles are the classroom tool that they're using, and then the takeaway is that they know, all right, we're only using rules three and seven when we sail across the Atlantic. Like if we're not going, North, we are never using rule nine. You know, rule nine is when the sun never sets. So I think they're kind of developing, and, and these textbooks never say, and I, I kept looking like, hey, you know, a Dutchman sailing to Asia is only really going to use these rules. Let's really drill them on these particular rules because these are the ones that are important when you cross the equator. These are the ones that are only relevant in the South Seas. No one is making that. Uh, explicit comment in, in the textbook. So I think understanding which rule to use is the new tacit takeaway, right? That they've had to develop this unspoken understanding of which rules make sense and are the, the ones that they would normally reach for. Um, and again, I think it has to be more 
nuance than just if you're both north, the sun and you are north, then use one, and then you're both south, use two. That's not enough, right? This is a much more complicated, 13 or 19 or whatever different number. Um, and so that that's what I would argue is the kind of new tacit takeaway rather than just if before the regimental, they're just like, oh, okay, I see the sun. I know I must be here. Um, they're using the rules and they've come up with this new, um, more refined um, kind of mathematized, mathematized knowledge. Um, but again, I, I think we can call it that some tacit, unspoken, you know, non, non textual knowledge that they've developed through this classroom textbook stuff. Thanks. More question? Enrique. Enrique, Lino, Lino, Enrique. Okay, if I, if I may. thank you very much, Margaret. So I think, the, tell me if you agree with me, yeah. but the, 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 the critical issue here is perhaps the visualization, right? Because one could reduce all of this to uh, simple algebraic expressions and then commit those to memory for, for all the cases. But this somehow was felt as not, you know, not the good thing to do, or I mean, not, not a tradition. So there seems to be something related with, you need to get a result. So you need to, you know, determine latitude by knowing the position of the sun, but you need to do it with some sort of visualization associated with it. And uh, this is interesting because you know, there is another instance of diagrams on, on, on maritime materials, which is they sometimes replace uh, lists of numbers, you know, tabular numbers or tables by graphical solutions, which right. they seem to prefer. So it seems to be that there is something going on with the need to have a visual picture. I don't know what you, right. what you think about this. Yeah, I mean, I think, so van der Brucke is like this really great textbook because he's kind of a small guy who doesn't have a big um, ripple effect. Like un unlike last Monarchy de Macher where they you know, have a century's worth of a legacy. He's this kind of individual. Um, and he starts his book with a list and he says, these are the 12 most important things that you need to understand. And they're kind of astronomical concepts. Um, and he recommends that you memorize it and you have to know this and you should read it, put it on a list above your bed and read it every night. And you need to know these details by heart. Mm -hmm. um, so again, this is like the traditional, the mariner's memory, right? How important it is to understand these things. Um, but again, he's this uh, very visually um, focused instructor, right? He's really adding as many diagrams as he can and he's borrowing them and he's, you know, adding his own new ones. Um, and I think that's what makes him a, an innovative instructor. I think he's saying um, there's a ton to memorize, like buckle up people, this is hard. Um, you know, you need to know the stars, you need to know, you have to understand the motion, you have to know the math, like this is, and so he's kind of offering lots of different options. Um, and I think you really, again, he's not the only instructor who talks about the importance of, of diagrams, right? Le Cordier, again, he's a little later, but he's, you know, 1680s, which is really when things are taking off in France. Um, and he, he just, and I think this is uh, out of the tradition of mathematical education, but if you're not drawing it yourself, again, I think he has a hierarchy, use an instrument, a globe, you know, and this is for geometry. And so arguably for cosmography, right? You need hands on a globe first. If you can't have a hands on a globe, draw your own diagram. If you can't draw your own, I offer you my two dimensional flat one in my textbook, but like really, if you want to understand it, you need your own diagram, your own tools. So um, I guess this is kind of interesting. Like the fact that like, if we go to the CASA and think about how they were teaching, you know, in the, I don't know, in, in the 1520s, mm -hmm. um, when you know they're saying here mm -hmm. take sacro bosco this is the way that you should learn you have to memorize these definitions um this is like we're treating you like university students even though you're mariners um and university students are expected to take notes and be examined on it and orally regurgitate the details 
whether that works for these pilots, you know, you tell me, I don't really think so, but it becomes that model, right? And, and however many of them are sitting in the classroom taking these notes, they still also have that moment where they're asked to demonstrate their instruments, right? They have a hands-on component to the exam. And so I think my reading of it is that traditional university lecture textbook uh, regurgitated information isn't sufficient when you're talking about something this complicated. So what the classroom instructors are offering the sailors is a theoretical framework for what they probably already know, right? They know that the heavens are round and they know that they're moving across a sphere and they know that things are spinning around them. But the first, these textbooks say, Here are the, here's the vocabulary that will help you discuss this. And then soon it becomes, if you don't know the vocabulary, you're not gonna pass your test, mm -hmm. right? And so, it's that kind of early stage. Um, then it's like, well, how do we make this easier, right? Because clearly this is complicated and just asking these guys to regurgitate de definitions doesn't mean they can go to sea and, yes. and apply it, right? So I think, you know, and it is out of that, that visual tradition of Appianus, like mm -hmm. there's a reason that his diagrams are so helpful. Mm -hmm. So I think you're, you're taking, university learnings, you know, learn university style, but there's already illustrations in there to help. Mm -hmm. And and then so that's what the, the sailors really need. Um, I think more diagrams, more more conceptual crutches. So anyways, that's that's a, a, a century and a half of an answer, but I think that's um, some of how we could understand it. So you know, please. My question actually follows up very easily, although it might not be so interesting to you to, for, to answer, but the thing is that I know you already discussed those things in your latest book, that's yeah. the thing, but could you maybe make explicit what kind of institutions you're talking about? So these small sailing schools, who is the audience mm -hmm. for these books? And I, I you know, yeah. briefly, because it's maybe yeah. not the main point of your talk today, but as a background, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. So again, I think we're, we're used to looking at maritime history in national traditions, right? And so there's been so much attention to the Spanish and the early origins. Um, but what I'm trying to argue is all of Europe was looking to Spain and uh, Portugal, you know, they're, they're wanting to understand what was making it easier for these Spanish sailors, right? They were successful, so they're trying to copy it. Um, and so the CASA, the school um, that sort of sets the standard becomes the model that gets exported elsewhere. And so most people, I think, have that idea of like, let's use this university model that was working in Seville and we're going to apply that and we're going to borrow that textbook and we're going to translate Medina into uh, Flemish or into French. Um, we're going to translate Cortez into English. Like there are all these, you know, like we're directly using this model um, and they apply that wherever they can, right? So then the little small independent schools take those textbooks and try and teach that same material. Um, and so do the national institutions, right? The French roll out a national program and they're trying to teach um, naval officers the same material. Um, so I really see that that kind of cosmographically inflected um, university education uh, goes across uh, Northwestern Europe. And when we start to see individuals like van der Brucke um, or other small independent people who may have never have published their own textbook, um, they start to add their own national um, priorities. So that's when we see the Dutch textbook pays more attention to the tides. And, you know, every Dutch textbook starts chapter one. We need to know how to calculate tides. Not so important when you're leaving from Spain, but when you're leaving from the, you know, you have to go through the shallow waters of the North Sea. If you are an hour off on your tide calculations, your whole fleet's aground. So um, for the Dutch, that's a concern that they have to kind of add into um, Medina's book, which otherwise doesn't pay attention to that type of thing. So anyways, I really have, have looked at as many records as I can. And some of them, again, are the kind of like the Royal Mathematical School in England. Um, and 
of course, it's the big state sponsored or, you know, important um, naval institutions that have better records preserved. Um, to find the small independent schools, you have to go through kind of um, evidence of these smaller textbooks. So. More question, Enrique, again? Yeah. Can I make one, one more? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> I, I don't know how to put my question, so uh, I, I hope I can, you know, somehow explain. My, my issue is, is there anything, is there anything maritime about this? Or is this just because the problem was, you know, complex and, you know, you, you showed it, it was not easy to depict this. Right. Or, so, so let I yeah. will put it in another way. Yeah. You documented, you know, yeah. a very interesting uh, uh, aspect of, you know, the cognitive uh, depiction of a certain, you know, mathematical astronomical event. But did did this it, did it took this shape yeah. because of the problem itself, or somehow because of the context, you know, the maritime context in it, right. it was so. I don't know if this made any sense to you, but. Well, don't you think that this kind of this spinning tools are so perfectly adapted for sailors because they're interested in the globe and, you know, mm -hmm. there's this relation between, you know, the rotations of the stars and the rotation of a clock, um, but then also that gets mapped onto the winds and the, you know, the 32 winds. And again, coming from the 20, 20th century, I wouldn't have said, oh yeah, I can see the direction and time are related. I think a sailor would say, of course, direction and time are related. We always know that, you know, on the equinox, the sun is coming up exactly east and, you know, every week thereafter it shifts. Like that's something that is missing from our modern understanding of the passing of time. But I think it would have been really, really evident to, mariners um and i mean the question is like we often see there's this similarity in the math that a surveyor or land surveyor is asked to do versus you know someone who's making a chart or a, a navigator at sea so what type of tools do the land surveyors use are they the same as the ones that the the mariners use well they can't totally be we need to have these more sturdy astrolabs but um I don't know. I mean, I'm just kind of um, brainstorming here, but what about these, like, they're the kind of rectangular um, tables and they're more interested in the, uh, the right angles of a property when they're surveying, you know, that's not what a sailor cares about. Sailors think in triangles. They think about these ways so the triangles rotate and they're either vertical or horizontal. I think the, you know, we can get some insights into them when we look at, um, you know, an astrolabe and how many different things. Like the fact that I found that um, Organum Ptolemae uh, is pretty exciting because again, the literature is like, well, these are only really in German. And I'm like, no, no, look, they are so essential to sailors, but we, we skip over that because we're like, well, that's just them explaining the framework of the universe. I'm like, but actually I think it's really important. I think we mm -hmm. have missed that little diagram of the slanted um, oblong. Yeah. because we already understand that you know fine the earth is tilted and but i think if you were embracing this for, for the first time again this is something i didn't get but the fact that like the angle at which this the ecliptic is going tells us the time mm -hmm. and the time that it's like that is information that would yes. have left left off the page for these readers that it, we need to be reintroduced to mm -hmm. so anyways, yeah. that that answers your question in a couple different ways but mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is definitely, um, I don't think mathematicians would need to know this, need to know how to apply it on the fly. And I think sailors need to apply mathematical principles at sea quickly and get a number, right? A mathematician can sit at home and carry it out and be really mm -hmm. careful and take the 15 minutes mm -hmm. for calculation. But what, what uh, comes to my mind is that, you yeah. know, uh, sailors have this constant problem that they are moving or for long yeah. periods they are moving in, right. in a region with no reference points yeah so they they continuously imagine circles right. yeah. So, yeah so, so they're used to this to this exercise of imagining an right. ecliptic a meridian a parallel right. yeah so 
I would, you know, this would, but this is just a suspicion. Maybe yeah. if this type of people that were trained, continuously trained in this, you have to imagine these circles, mm -hmm. yeah. then it, it, it was very obvious, very natural to let's just draw them. You know, I, yeah. I like this. I can, yeah. but right. you know. <laughs> well, also, I think, right, like the fact that for these 16th century Spanish sailors that need to learn the vocabulary to talk about what they already know right i think that's the purpose of sitting in the school like they already know how to yes. make their observations but because there's someone st setting standards and they have to pass a test they need to learn kind of have to retrofit their information it's different for the people you know in the 1680s who don't have that same um, experience they're not 40 year old and they've already been sailing for 20 they're like 16 and they need to figure out how to do this um, and i think that if you look at these other textbooks like especially the english ones that start with addition subtraction multiplication they don't have an assumption about where you are on the globe whereas i think like again the 16th century if you were approaching this from a sacrobosco cosmographical you were thinking about where you are on the globe and why your observations have to match the heavens and the pole and the zenith and everything. I don't, I don't see that that's how the late 17th century textbooks are teaching people. It's, it's almost like it's irrelevant where you are and you don't need to know these definitions. As long as you can compute things, you don't have to understand where you are on the globe. So I think that's kind of an interesting shift. And I think that the intervening steps of the people who had to take the tacit knowledge from the year 1500 and explain how to teach it. Um, they had to go through these steps of understanding where they were. But then by 1650 or 1680, those preliminary steps aren't necessary. So I don't, I don't, I don't know, but I think, I think there's definitely this shift over time in, in what baseline knowledge you need. So have you guys seen anything like this in Spanish sources? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I am. I am checking now the Alonso de Chavez Quatri Party, and yeah, um, yeah. I don't know if there are anything related to this diagram. There are uh, not a lot of visual uh, yeah. figure in this in this text. Just an astrolabe and quadrants and any yeah. other nautical instrument, but not a cycle uh, diagram. Yeah. So it really like this sort of topic suggested itself to me because I'm like, why are there so many? What are they doing, right? And how did they learn that the angle of this line is going to give them a number, right? And so then I tried to trace it back to see, well, when did they start using this? And that was what was really surprising that it's always in the sun chapter, it's always in the altitude lesson, but the first set of, of people who talk about it are using the shadow, right? They're talking about you and your position, and then you're just supposed to add or subtract, you figure it out. So then I think, and this is a little bit of the, the question mark, like it's surprising to me that Van der Brucke would have been the first person to devise this, this circle where you can adjust your line. Um, so he must have gotten it from somewhere. And I think like Blau doesn't quite do it. So I think somewhere in the Netherlands there around 1600, some mathematician might've had this model of, or astronomer, I don't know. Um, and then it kind of works its way into the navigation textbooks, but I can't exactly trace it. I think there, again, I think it's someone who's deeply familiar with, with Appianus, um, but coming out of a different, a non not navigational tradition so I, again i'm kind of and i would be really interesting to know if there's anything um in the spanish texts and again you see like cortez talks about um the human body right and how he uses the human body in the arms and the head as the north um and that it's this kind of age-old idea of like the human body is the measure of of the heavens or of man's position or you know you would use yourself as a measuring tool right um and that that disappears we don't see that continuing the kind of human uh, you you see hands um but you don't see the human body anymore you replace it with the compass um and so i i guess i wonder like does the shadow and the human shadow 
disappear in the same way and get replaced by this. It does in the north, but what's happening in Iberia? How are they tackling this problem after they stop using, you know, Apianus? Um, are they still like, are they using the 13 rules? Are they using his complicated series of diagrams? Uh, or as, as you suggested, like, have they just memorized the rules and they don't need to worry about the um, figuring out where they are? They just know, okay. I'm north, the sun's north, my shadow's going that way, that means rule six. Like, you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, anyways, I think there's just more to be done, right? That's just, this is the interesting issue. I have a question, Margaret. Uh, yeah. I, I think we, we can put this question between the Enrique's question and Lino's question. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to know anything else or more, more information, more things about mm -hmm. the recipients yeah. of these diagrams. Uh, the question is, uh, have these diagrams anything to do with the social scale of these uh, pilots, of these navigator students? Mm. Uh, who were exactly they? Uh, you you can say you can say anything else about this. Yeah, well, again, the the example where the people the teachers talk the most are are the French, and again, it's like Le Cordier who's saying. We need this comprehension. We need to really understand. And that's what's interesting about Medina when he's like, you need to understand when to use which rule and you know, memorize it and um, make sure you really grasp it. Um, so it, he's not asking for just a simple memorization. He's asking for, you need to know when to apply these. Um, and so we don't see in those early Spanish books, anyone saying, take your pencil and do X, right? We don't, don't, you know, draw it, write it down, add it up. Like it's not in, in there. Um, and I guess, I mean, we, we haven't recovered manuscript workbooks the same way um, in Spain. Why not? Like, is there some different, is it still this oral tradition of their memorizing stuff? Were they taking notes in the classroom? I mean, wouldn't that be amazing if we could find anything like that? But um, I guess I just, I just, let me think. Another way to try and answer it is, what is the educational situation in an average Spanish city, right? And I think if we went to Italy, we're like, okay, they have the tobacco schools. We know everyone is crunching numbers and adding math and they're, they're going and paying for these lessons. And that's the same case in the Netherlands, right? You would go, uh, and school is like a French school, which is different from a Latin school. And, you know, the French one would be more practical with math um, and business math, really. And so my argument is like the French don't have a baseline understanding of addition and subtraction until they come in from the field and sit down in this free classroom, right? Where they're trying to be turned into sailors. The Dutch probably went to sea when they were 12 with their uncle. Um, their uncle might have, you know, been investing in something. Everyone on board that ship knows how to calculate who owes who money. Why? A lot of them have been to these mathematical classes. Um, they paid for them and they, you know, so they have a, a, a baseline of, you know, numeracy as well as literacy. Um, and so again, in England, do you see this in London? You see some, you know, independent schools in London where people can go and pay and get these lessons. So what we need to find is, are there independent schools in Spain or is it all the CASA? Like, where are you going? And then what education do you have before you sit down in that navigation school? Um, again, so I think in the Netherlands, they're just like, oh yeah, we just, bring your notebook, buy your paper from the teacher, um, you know, and don't forget your, your mathematical toolkit, like your, you know, your compass and your drawing stuff, like everyone would, would have that or be able to buy it um, to participate in these classes. So anyways, I think. Well, for, you know, for the 17th century, especially yeah. for the second half of the 17th century, yeah. I think it's obvious that the mathematical level of you know sailors training in the Netherlands was yeah. considerably higher yeah. than one that you can find in Iberia. Yeah. Baseline of mathematical knowledge when sailors entered 
was somehow distinct because you could start from already, right. I think for the second half, I would not say this for perhaps for the 16th century, but yeah. for the later part of the 17th, I think it's right. clear. Right. Or like the trigonometry, right? Is in with the Dutch really early and it's not, I mean, maybe the 1730s they're starting to teach sailors trig and logarithms, which, you know, um, again, I'd love to know earlier examples, but it just seems like, and it could be that, well, this has worked without trig. Like we don't need higher math, it's been working. So why, why teach people something complicated? Um, so again, it's like, what were they doing instead, right? Were they using their instruments? And again, the instruments are doing the math instead of, so then the actual navigator doesn't need to. Um, Again, like you find all these complaints, right? Especially the French are like, stop making your own notches on your backstaffs because you're making them inaccurate, you know? Like, uh, and so as soon as you find someone complaining about something, you know, must have been somewhat common, uh, but we don't see that in the Spanish. They're not, they're not saying leave your tools alone and don't customize them. Um, but again, maybe they are and it's all in manuscript and we just don't have printed editions that are easily, uh, accessible to scholars. I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to find a manuscript that was sort of similar um, because they're so pre prevalent elsewhere, you know, and you kind of think, well, is it that there's this assumption like we don't, I mean, I think you find in, in Spanish texts by the like 1690s, right, a recognition that like the center of navigation education has shifted north, right? Like um, we would have to go north to, to get the cutting edge stuff. But I think before that, people are like, no, no, Spain is the, the place where all the important stuff has happened. So I don't know. I think it just kind of goes back to this sort of centralized system um, and you have to go, I don't know, you have to go through the CASA to, to be certified and so everyone is doing that and they're not, it's, they're not allowed to go elsewhere. They'd be viewed as too dangerous to have a Spanish sailor come and take a class in the Netherlands. Maybe that's part of it. Whereas a, like a German or a Scandinavian sailor is, is sort of welcome to come and pay their money and, you know, I don't know. And, yeah. and what, is the, what is the origin of this, uh, uh, the use of diagrams in, in navigation? Because you, you speak about a piano and Sacrobosco tradition. But yeah. there are anything related to the Islamic tradition? Or... I don't know. I'm just teaching this Galileo class, right? And talking about how these, these diagrams of the universe are so similar. Um, I don't know. Right. right? Like, we, I mean, it, again, like these textbooks, again, you kind of skip over it because you're like, okay, they have a little Ptolemaic, you know, universe at the beginning fine that we know that but i haven't really paused to analyze to see if those shift or the way that they're described shifts like that would be also interesting um yeah no i'd love to know again like a place where like the astrolabe is invented the sophisticated math is there you know um who's talking about these different ways of of drawing the heavens and there, it's all circles right it's all still circles but and the other thing that was interesting, I think in Appianus, right, that you can see the, um, like these, they're like the tunnels um, for the, each planet. And again, you're like, why is that in a navigation? Well, that's in, that's in um, Appianus. So again, if I was like teaching the history of science, I'd be like, here, here's where this is the kind of understanding of the Ptolemaic universe. But I don't think about that when I'm doing the maritime analysis. Thing. I'm just like, oh yeah, whatever. And I'm, I mean, it may, like maybe many students just skip over certain parts of a textbook, right? So we don't know whether they skipped over the part about you know, the Ptolemaic model of the universe. Like, oh. <laughs> I know what a pole is. I know what a, the ecliptic is. Those are the two things I need and I can just skip everything else. <laughs> okay, thank you, Margaret. Uh, more questions, more comments? Okay, so we think, I think I, it's time to close the seminar if you want. Thank you. Very much.